Okay, here we go. Now it's working. So we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, just waiting for Senator Hannibal Jackson, but she's on the phone with the governor uh, talking about a couple things. So with that, uh, I want to welcome and thank everybody coming for our first meeting of the Joint Legislative Committee on Emergency Management. So I want to thank everyone once again for the Committee on Emergency Management's hearing on health care surge capacity. Is California ready for disaster and disease treatment? This hearing will examine how a natural disaster or widespread infectious disease such as Ebola, influenza, or measles might cause our health system to overload and what California's health care response would be to it. Recent news and concerns about measles, flu, Ebola, earthquakes, and other disasters have placed a focus on state planning for capacity response and our need to be prepared. Surge capacity is the ability of our health care system to respond to a widespread disease or mass casualty events and to adequately care for the sudden influx of patients with common or unusual medical needs. It refers to the ability to evaluate and care for the remarkably increased volume of patients when the challenges or exceeds normal operating capacity. The surge requirements may extend beyond direct patient care to include such tasks as extensive laboratory studies or other investigations. Medical surge also describes the ability to provide adequate medical evaluation and care during these events that exceed the limits of normal medical infrastructure or an affected community. It encompasses the ability of our healthcare system to survive a hazard impact and maintain or rapidly recover operations that were compromised. The committee wants to know where there, there may be gaps and to receive recommendations on where we can improve. We look forward to hearing from state agencies and others involved in healthcare field to determine what we should do. I also want to thank Assemblymember Lackey and uh, Assemblymember Cooper has joined us. If uh, would they have a few words to share before we get started? Oh, I'm sorry, and Senator Bates. I just want to um, express my appreciation, certainly from the 36th Senate District, uh, where we do have an issue uh, regarding an emergency room that's, uh, you know, going, let's say it's under uh, a change and with the changing healthcare uh, management system that we are experiencing, uh, this is very timely because the surge issue uh, will, emergency rooms are going to be the recipients of that and if moving, removing one from the system uh, as might happen here, it will be very significant to the population there. So we're working on something, hope that it uh, will you know, be a hybrid of sorts that we can have uh, approval here in the legislature. But this information I'll receive today will be very important as we continue those discussions. So thank you, Assemblymember uh, Rodriguez, for convening this. It's very timely. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Assemblymember Cooper or Lackey? I'd like to thank the chair and also Chair uh, Jackson for convening this. I think it is a timely uh, issue to bring forward, and I look forward to a very healthy discussion. Senator Lackey? Yeah, this is truly a, a privilege to, to uh, join together, and I appreciate the, the chair, uh, both the vice chair and the chair, for allowing me this opportunity to join in this discussion. There are a number of imminent threats that... Uh, we're likely to face here in the future, and so it's always important that uh, government take its role very serious, that we uh, organize and that we're prepared to uh, throw the safety net out when, uh, when the demand calls, because it will come. Especially in my district where we're on the San Andreas Fault, uh, the earthquake circumstance is always a very real threat that could happen minutes, hours, or years, we don't really know, but we need to be prepared for when the big event actually strikes, that we're able to uh, address the challenges that uh, face our, our communities. So this is a privilege to join in this discussion. Thank you. Uh, so with that, we'll get started. We're going to have uh, two panels. Our first panel will start with government agencies. And with that, I'll do an introduction to the California Department of Health, Public Health is the lead state agency in developing surge capacity in California. Working in cooperation with the hospitals, medical providers, clinics, laboratories, doctors, local government, emergency personnel, and others, the CDPH has over the past decade developed a comprehensive plan to address surges in healthcare demand. In December 2005, the CDPH established a surge capacity data work group to collect consistent preparedness data from its local healthcare provider partners. 
The CDPH has conducted statewide assessments of surge capacity based on standardized definitions and has measured current surge capacity against benchmarks for various events that would lead to surge in demand for health care. A gap analysis has been completed and CDPH proposed a surge initiative to mitigate surge gaps for both moderate and catastrophic events. Since the start of the project, the CDPH has established programs for surge capacities for hospitals, alternative care sites, prayers, community care clinics, and others. This has included comprehensive planning for disease or natural disasters, terrorist activities, and other commonalities that have created a surge in health care utilization. Here today, representing the California Department of Public Health is Gilberto Chavez, MD, Deputy Director, Center for Infectious Diseases, and Susan Fennell, Deputy Director, Emergency Preparedness Office. Thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you. Good morning, Chair and members. Um, I'm Susan Finelli, Deputy for Emergency Preparedness with the California Department of Public Health. I'm going to start out with talking about the system that we've put in place for public health and medical response and then turn it over to Gil, who will talk about infectious disease control and, and the important role that Department of Public Health plays there. Um, so we've invested a lot of money at, um, in the public health and medical emer emergency preparedness across um, a collaborative network where we've really worked with both state and local partners, departments, um, Emergency Medical Services Agency and the healthcare delivery system. And that network has really strengthened our ability to respond to public health and medical emergencies and adopt a consistent all hazards approach to preparing for disasters that most likely will occur in California. Um, in collaboration with our partner, EMSA, Emergency Medical Services Authority, who we work closely with, um, we have developed the Emergency Operations Manual, which really sets out a standardized way for um, the public health and medical community to come together to report situational awareness and to um, ask for resources that they may need during an event. We have a whole structure in place, starting with our Medical Health Operational Area Coordinator Program, which is um, a combination of public health and medical um, emergency medical services agencies, which have 17 identified public health and medical functions, and really that's a 24-7 system that allows people at the operational area or county level to keep a status and pulse of what the system looks like right now. That then filters to the Regional Disaster Medical Health Coordinator Program, which in every mutual of each of the six mutual aid regions, we put a regional um, person there to coordinate across the operational areas within that region and really to connect with emergency management, um, local, uh, regional OES. And so really looking at that RDMHS program or C program coordinator and specialist to keep a pulse and to help um, at the lowest level possible to deal with any surge or any other resource requests from a healthcare facility. Um, and then CDP and EMSA, as you know, under the state emergency plan have the lead, serve as the lead agencies for public health and medical. Um, so medical surge, obviously during any emergency, the most important thing is to save lives and relieve suffering. And so that is the ultimate goal of our first leg of response. Um, and this will need in many events to have a, um, an increase in the capacity of the medical system. And to meet that demand, um, We've been working with hospitals across the state uh, for the past um, 10, 12 years in planning for a 15 to 20 percent increase in beds. And again, we'd, we're going to talk about sort of that progression of healthcare facilities because you don't just flip to surge standards as we've laid out. It's a progression from, you know, really looking at the increase in the need for patient care and the system changes that occur over time. And so healthcare coalitions across the state have also helped to build capacity in the state in a, for the stepwise progression. Um, dorm, during normal health care delivery, the system works to distribute patients across facilities. And so that um, one of the examples that was questioned, a question to us was, well, what happens when an emergency room closes or goes on diversion? That's a normal part of the system as we try to distribute patients under the same rules and keep everything intact as we move patients across the system. But as the conditions worsen and the emergency gets worse and we need to expand that bed capacity, there are many actions that facilities can take to expand that capacity. And that includes flexes from licensing and certification to allow them to have um, patients in other areas of the hospital to exceed their license capacity. It may also, um, as things get much worse, may request waivers from state and federal law to increase their surge capacity. And so really looking at their ability to treat additional patients when we start looking at things 
like EMTALA and HIPAA and some of the um, regulations around staffing patterns, some of those things may need to be waived during um, a large-scale event for at least some period of time as we look at treating the most patients that we can. Um, catastrophic events such as the large magnitude earthquake that we all worry about. Um, again, keep in mind we haven't had a catastrophic event probably since 1906. And so as we look at what a catastrophic event means, we need to keep that in perspective of the kinds of disasters that we have faced and then what a catastrophic event may look like. Um, and again, at a catastrophic event such as an earthquake, we're not all only talking about um, those patients that are injured by the event, but we're talking about facilities that may be damaged and need to be evacuated at the same time as the system is hit with that medical surge. Um, and again, according to um, OSHPAD or the Office of Statewide Health Planning and Development, um, a significant number of hospitals have campuses or buildings on their campuses that would be at risk during a major earthquake. Um, so these large-scale events will result in infrastructure problems as well. Not only will we have infrastructure problems that may damage a hospital, but the loss of power and water will also make it hard to um, have continue safe operation of those facilities. Um, hospitals may need to shelter in place even if they are damaged for some period of time. So the healthcare delivery system will be expanded through the use of field treatment sites, through potentially alternate care sites adjacent to the impacted area as we try to treat patients before we even move them to hospitals. In addition, the state and government assets will immediately be deployed to um, look at that, um, particularly state um, assets of that immediate need and then followed by um, federal assets. Um, so we are really looking at, during um, those events, relying on that public health and medical system that we've put in place to give us good information. Um, and again, in a catastrophic event, it's really important to remember that in the first hours, we're not going to have good information. So we're going to operate according to the catastrophic planning that we've done, where assets will be deployed immediately as we then figure out how they will be used and where they will be used. Um, and to assist the healthcare facilities increasing their surge capacity, you talked a little bit about our surge guidelines and back in 2006 and 7 when we had a large initiative in the um, state to purchase for, at that time we were planning for avian flu, purchase medical supplies and assets and really work on surge capacity. So our surge standards and guidelines are in place. We continue to use them to make sure that we have good disaster plans in our hospitals um, that include medical surge, evacuation, shelter in place. These plans are tested annually um, in the November statewide medical and health exercise um, in scenarios such as earthquakes, pandemic, anthrax attack, which is what we're doing this um, November. We'll be doing a large-scale Southern California anthrax attack um, and trying to see how 11 counties will come together to really look at um, how they will respond to that. And then we also focus on things like loss of power and loss of utilities so that people can individually look at how they would address those needs. Um, so we then would turn to our medical assets to put them in place um, and then looking at updating our catastrophic plans and continuing to exercise those so that we really do have um, a good system in place that's well tested. Um, I'm going to next turn it over to Gil, who's going to talk about the role of um, of public health, the critical role that we play in really looking at controlling those outbreaks to stop that surge from ever hitting the hospitals. So, and then I'll come back and talk about what we have identified as some gaps in our preparedness. Okay, before we uh, go on to the next uh, talk, I want to welcome uh, Senator Pan and Senator Roth if they wanted to say a few words as we continue before we continue. Senator Pan? Uh, I just want to thank you, uh, Senator Rodriguez, for holding this hearing. Um, you know, actually, when I was chair of the Assembly Health Committee, when I was, uh, we did, I did hold a hearing uh, looking at uh, public health infrastructure. So I know Dr. Chavez is going to be speaking soon, and I look forward to his remarks uh, about that. But uh, you know, we were faced with, uh, we were looking at that time. Uh, well, Ebola, although it's not all that infectious, we had uh, um, influenza, uh, uh, you know, bad outbreak. We also had this mysterious enterovirus that we were dealing with. So clearly, infectious disease is something that. Uh, uh, we, we need to confront, and then we had measles uh, that showed up in, in, uh, that, uh, that last December. So certainly I think uh, we need to look at our capacity to be able to address uh, the, the, these uh, various contagions, and I appreciate the hearing. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Senator Jackson came in just in time. I would like to say a few words as we continue. Thank you. Well, I'm sorry to be late. 
There's nothing else going on around here today, <laughs> sir. Um, first of all, I want to thank the chair for uh, hosting this. And, uh, you know, emergency management really um, is frequently the test uh, of the public or by the public for how well we as a government are doing our job. Uh, there's really nobody who can, uh, that we expect or who can step in during times of uh, crisis to, to do the work that needs to be done. And um, I appreciate uh, the fact that we're here today to talk about uh, an issue that if, God forbid, but if and when it does happen, the public is going to expect and demand that we are uh, as ready as is humanly possible to to address these issues, and um, you know, there's no uh, we get no wiggle room. We have to do the best that we can, and I know that this is of interest to uh, all the members who are here and those uh, who are unable to be here at least uh, in person. So, um, uh, last year when I chaired this, uh, uh, we were focusing on some of the climate change issues, and one of the issues actually had to do with the possibility uh, of climate change and the evolving uh, bacteria and health issues associated uh, with t changes in weather, uh, in temperature increases, in uh, uh, water and airborne uh, viruses and bacteria that were previously not on our radar screens. Uh, and then just in general, because we have more people needing health care and the greater possibility for disease and unexpected situations to arise. So I'm uh, very much looking forward to uh, hearing about the different uh, ways that we are uh, responding and preparing, and hopefully we'll never need it. But if we do, the public expects that we will be there uh, in every way humanly possible to deal with the problem. So. Thank you for the opportunity to say a few remarks, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Senator. Uh, Gilbert, go ahead. Yes, good morning, everyone. Um, and uh, thank you, Senator Pan. I think he, he knows public health and infectious diseases quite well and provided a good outline of my brief remarks, so it's uh, very, very timely. Uh, you know, I think it's very uh, critical that we uh, think of infectious diseases whenever we're thinking of uh, a potential surge in healthcare needs, uh, and I'm very thankful that the committee uh, thought of including a few remarks on infectious diseases. Um, as you know, California finds itself at the crossroads of global travel, migration, and commerce, so we must be constantly hypervigilant to protect uh, the public from emerging infectious diseases, threats from around the world. Public health emergencies such as Ebola virus disease or other emerging infectious diseases will present very distinct challenges to the healthcare delivery system including needs for staff training, proper personal protective equipment, and infrastructure requirements. In close collaboration with the public health and medical communities, we are monitoring for the earliest signs of appearance of these illnesses here in California to prevent their potential spread. A thriving public health system is essential to prevent their potential spread and to mitigate the impact of these infectious diseases on the healthcare system in the state. Next, I will provide some examples and actions that um, we in public health have taken to uh, illustrate how, it is imp how important it is to control outbreaks of infectious diseases to lessen the impact on the people of the state. Uh, the state of California, for example, has implemented a robust program of preparedness and response for Ebola at both the state and at the local levels. CDPH, in collaboration with multiple agencies, developed strategies and conducted activities to support the public health and medical response for the monitoring, assessment, laboratory testing, transportation, and treatment of persons with suspect of or confirmed Ebola. In addition, worker safety and healthcare programs and policies and personal protective equipment trainings and procurement were enhanced to ensure safety for everyone involved in the Ebola response. Hospitals across the state stepped up to prepare for their roles as frontline hospitals in identifying travelers returning from Ebola-impacted countries. The University of California Medical Centers and Kaiser Permanente Health System have both invested millions of dollars in infrastructure cost and staff time to prepare eight facilities to serve as Ebola treatment facilities. Additional hospitals are preparing to serve as Ebola assessment hospitals. These efforts have built sustainable capacity for responding to any special pathogen that surfaces in the future in our state. 
Now, let me briefly highlight California's recent experience with what I consider the new normal, which is a state of constant assault by a myriad of infectious diseases that we must daily keep at bay. In the past year alone, California experienced a large outbreak of measles due to an importation of disease and transmission at Disney theme parks. This outbreak resulted in thousands of Californians being exposed to measles and required an extensive and expensive public health response to contain it. Without an aggressive public health response, such as the one we mounted, the number of measles cases and measles hospitalizations would have been significantly higher, putting additional strain in an already strained healthcare system. Fatalities would likely have happened. Epidemic of more than 10,000 cases of whooping cough occurring in California in both 2010 and 2014. California has seen more than a dozen previously healthy babies died as a result of what is an entirely preventable illness. Hospitalizations due to pertussis also surged during these outbreaks. Pertussis is a re-emerging infection and we are likely con to continue to see increases. In 2014, also California quickly responded to a national, nationwide emergence of enterovirus D68, which caused severe respiratory illness in children and was linked to an acute polio-like paralysis in some rare cases. Mosquito-borne illnesses are a growing threat to California. In 2014, we saw the most severe season ever for West Nile virus in California. Now we are facing a new threat through the invasive Aedes mosquito that is capable of transmitting chikungunya and dengue viruses, and these uh, mosquitoes are spreading across the state. Outbreaks have already occurred in Florida and Texas, and there is a particular risk here in our very own state of California in the border region due to the transmission of these diseases occurring in Mexico. <laughs> Lastly, all foes such as foodborne illnesses, including E. coli and salmonella, and valley fever continue to, threat, to pose a threat to the people of the state. Last year, California faced a large outbreak of Salmonella Heidelberg infections that infected hundreds of Californians after consumption of contaminated chicken. Valley fever, an ever-present threat in parts of the state, causes thousands of illnesses, hospitalizations, and results in hundreds of millions of dollars in healthcare costs in California each year. In summary, prevention, preparedness, and a swift public health response are among the best tools in our arsenal to limit the impact of old and new infectious diseases in our healthcare system, and to mitigate and prevent the need for potential surge. I now will transfer the microphone back to my colleague, Ms. Finelli. So our ability to respond really depends on a number of things, updated response plans, trained staff, continuous testing of those plans through drills and exercises, and the um, ability to use the resources at the local, state, and federal levels. Um, our preparedness funding has declined over the years and reached a critical point for us in terms of staffing supplies and technology systems. Um, right now, we're not asking for new dollars, but if federal dollars do come down, um, then we would be here asking for more dollars in terms of maintaining our staff and funding. Um, we, uh, I think we do have maybe a small proposal for some catastrophic planners. Um, there's been a vast improvement in our public health and medical response structure over the last 10 to 12 years, but to maintain that structure and our response capacity, we really do um, have a couple of areas that are out there for improvement. We have limited bed capacity in the state for pediatric patients and burn patients. Um, we know that many facilities are training staff to treat and stabilize patients within facilities that don't normally treat those patients, but through technology and through connecting with other facilities, we think during a um, large-scale event where we had additional burn page patients or pediatric patients that we would be able to at least stabilize patients throughout other facilities in the state. But we need to do more work and continue that effort as, you know, they're, we're not going to magically have more burn beds or more pediatric beds. Um, statewide patient movement and transportation plans, we are currently working on that. Although there are operational area plans and in some cases even some regional plans, we are, um, EMSA has taken the lead, but building a regional statewide patient movement plan um, that we need to test and we need to be diligent about making sure we have a way to move patients across the state and across the nation. 
Uh, catastrophic planning drills and exercises, we are heavily engaged with FEMA and Cal OES in lots of catastrophic plans for earthquakes, for floods, for uh, recovery, a number of things, and we just need to keep doing those plans and keep updating them um, and make sure that we run full-scale exercises at least every couple of years so that we really know that we can respond. A plan is only a plan. If you don't test it, we don't really know. And so we need to continue and really get every level of the response in those exercises. Crisis care guidelines, executive orders, um, we have put um, our surge standards and guidelines really did look at the ethics around scarce resources and how you allocate scarce resources during time of crisis, but we need to do more work there. Um, crisis care guidelines really goes from when we are focused on individual care for people to population-based care, and we really need to have a system in place or at least guidelines from the state that can help facilities who are going to have to make difficult choices in allocating scarce resources in a catastrophic event. Um, the other piece we've been working on is those executive orders that and those waivers that we may need to put in place to give um, facilities protection from liability, give um, physicians and other clinicians some protection that we do have some protection in law, but I think everyone would argue that we may need to do more during a catastrophic event to ensure sure that people really can do the work that we need them to do. Uh, medical supplies and equipment and our state stockpile, we invested a lot of money several years ago in stockpiled assets. Many of those assets are coming up on their lifeline um, and are expiring. Um, and so we don't propose buying, you know, back when we were planning for avian flu, I think everybody in the world was sort of stockpiling these huge stockpiles, and they're very expensive. And it's very expensive not only to purchase them, but to keep them. And so what we would, over time, uh, really like to do is have smaller quantities of those supplies for those first 24 or 48 hours purchased over a longer period of time so that we keep their shelf life um, and that we have some capability at all times to for that launching that immediate response, but that we don't invest, you know, we invested at one point $186 million um, at one once. And so now we've learned, I think uh, the whole nation has learned about how to stockpile better, how to, and we did purchase some of those assets over time. So we do have, you know, some um, still um, valid um, supplies and equipment and antivirals, but they will be coming up on their lifeline. And then finally, um, you know, I think everybody's well aware of the healthcare facility seismic safety issues, and we, I think, in catastrophic events, need to at least be um, aware of those and understand that that's going to be a, an issue. Could, could I just uh, think with that? Go ahead with comments. Um, you said you're not asking for any more money. Does that mean that you feel as though the resources you have are sufficient? And if that is not the case, um, what would you need if you were going to be asking for more money? I, I hate to see us being shy about what our needs are because, you know, we think that it's not appropriate to be asking for more. So what would it take to get you what you think you need, or are we there? Well, I think we can always run more drills and exercises, and we need – staff to do that. We need assets. We need planners. And so I think if there were one thing that we would put more effort into if we had more staff and more resources, not only for the state departments, but for healthcare facilities and others, that um, to really dedicate to an annual full-scale exercise, I think that would really help us to um, you know, be better prepared, because that's the way you really know if you're prepared. Um, we will be asking as our supplies um, d you know, come out of data over time to replace some of those supplies and probably take a new look at what we really need in terms of PPE and some of the other issues as we have better experience from Ebola of what type of PPE we may need for some of these special pathogens. So we're building some of that. We did get some Ebola funding, which um, is helping us to meet that gap right now uh, across the state. Um, I think that's probably... You know, it's staff intensive, and so I think we're at a critical mass of staff, and if we lose more staff, that will impact our ability to respond. Thank you. Uh, Senator Roth, you have a question? I don't know, if, um, Mr. Chair, if this is the right time to ask questions, but since you called on me, I'll, I'll, I'll ask one. <clears throat> Ma'am, the agenda and the material, the backup material, uh, talks about the 2006-07 budget and the surge capacity that was built into the budget and the purchases that resulted. And it references uh, three 200-bed mobile field hospitals and supplies and equipment for 
21,000 alternative care site beds. I wonder if you could tell me what the state of that equipment is, and in particular the state of the mobile field hospitals um, with respect to the equipment to the extent the pharmaceuticals are maintained, and also, it's a compound question, and also how long it would take us as a state to deploy those hospitals to areas of need should there be a, a mass <coughs> critical situation requiring uh, health care systems on the ground. Sure. So I will address the medical supplies and equipment and then turn to EMSA, who actually has the mobile field hospital, so Lisa can address that. But on the medical supplies and equipment, the 21,000 beds included eight categories of supplies and equipment, everything from trauma type to cots and blankets and really the ability to treat 50, the caches are 420 caches, and the ability was to treat 50 patients for eight to 10 days. Um, many of those, like the IV fluids and the things that were disposable, you know, that had lifetimes on them are gone. Um, and so we are not replacing those assets, but we do have still, you know, a lot of supplies and equipment that could be distributed to hospitals or alternate care sites or medical shelters that could be put into play right now um, to help to um, care for patients. Um, and with that, I'll turn over to well, the mobile field well, hospital. But, but before we leave uh, your subject area, so how long would it take you to deploy those to the field if you needed to do so? And are you indicating that, that, there, that the supplies and equipment are usable, notwithstanding the fact that the IVs and the other uh, so expendables the, are gone? We think we could deploy them within 6 to 12 hours. We have trucking contracts that we could use. They're in warehouses um, in central and northern California. So depending on where in the state we had to deploy them, we could deploy them pretty quickly. Perfect. So they're geographically dispersed. Perfect. Uh, okay. Follow-up question, Susan. So with that, what we have, how many patients could retreat? I mean, you talk about So we wouldn't numbers. have everything we need to treat patients, but... But what we have now, despite the, the IVs, but about how many... So we still have equipment for 21,000 beds. 21,000 beds. Um, so 21,000 cots and, and um, Band-Aids and splints and all of those kinds of things. Um, but what we don't have are IV fluids and pharmaceuticals because they're not part of those caches. 